right, guys. Well, welcome to the Cloning and Assembly Plans webinar. My name is Ian Schlander. I work for the National Renewable Energy Lab in Colorado, the United States. Um, I'm with Alexi Casas, and he was a PhD student at the Imperial College of London, and we are presenting this on behalf of the iGEM Measurement Committee. So first, we wanted to say welcome to the iGEM Opening Weekend Festival. Um, we know there is a lot of new things with this year, um, and so we're happy to provide you guys with some webinars and stay in contact and reach out to you guys and open up communication and discussion. So always feel free to leave comments and um, open up the Q&A uh, chat and reach out to us after this. Um, we are here for you. But today we will be discussing the role of cloning and assembly in synthetic biology design steps in constructing a genetic device, cloning and gene assembly methods, and also listing the tools and resources at your disposal as an iGEM team. Before we get into this talk, I wanted to mention that um, on any one of these topics, we could go for hours and probably design a whole class on one of these, but um, we are going to introduce this, the, the, the concepts and hopefully prepare you guys and hopefully you guys have questions and um, want to reach out and follow up with us later on anything that we bring up in this talk. So with that, um, who are we? Uh, my name is Ian Schlander. Um, in 2018, I was introduced to uh, iGEM. I was a pre-med student and basically fell in love with my synthetic biology as um, I was FSU, team FSU team leader. Um, and I couldn't stay away from iGEM, so I moved on to become a 2019 judge and an FSU advisor. Uh, and I'm proud to say that they won the gold medal for the 2019 competition. And um, now I have transitioned out of my undergraduate time to uh, as a metabolic engineer at the National Renewable Energy Lab. And as you see there, it's a picture of me, 2018, giving my presentation. And so, hello everyone. Um, I'm Alexis. Uh, I'm an engineer, and I got a background in computer science and electronics and automatics. And I'm super excited about iGEM starting out because um, I started my journey in synthetic biology when I first heard about iGEM, and I just got blown away. Uh, I had no idea you could engineer like living organisms and program DNA, and it just went crazy. And then I didn't really know how to start, so I found a biohacker lab. I was in Montreal at the time. And it turned out that it was created by ex uh like Kevin Chen, who talked at the startup panel yesterday. And I spent a summer there. And then I met a lovely iGEM team in Paris. And I hung out in the lab with them and they learned with them. And you can actually learn a lot from your peers because you all have different backgrounds in your teams. And that's a big chance. And then the next year, I joined officially an iGEM team. And um, here I am today. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, three questions. We're going to answer three questions. Um, the first one is, what is cloning and gene assembly? Second one is, why is cloning and gene assembly important? And how is cloning and gene assembly done? So the what? Um, what is it? So cloning and gene assembly is the process of stitching the different pieces of DNA together and putting them inside a living organism. And then why is cloning and gene assembly important? because um, it's the basis of your design and engineering processes. So how is that done? How do you clone? How do you, genus, how do you assemble genes? Well, it's done through various uh, molecular biology techniques and also with the help of the organism natural molecular machinery. So what's uh, recombinant DNA? Well, um, behind um, this word, it's just recombining pieces of DNA from multiple sources. And you can get natural DNA uh, from an organism, or you can get synthesized DNA. So now we're going to go um, 50 years back in time, um, in almost 50 years, uh, in 1972, to go through the history of recombinant DNA. So we start in 1972 uh, with the work of Herbert Boyer uh, from the University of California, San Francisco and Stanley Cohen from Stanford. And these two scientists observed um, an enzyme that could cut the DNA in a certain way, and in such a way that would make different pieces of DNA overlap. And then um, they discovered enzymes to cut DNA from different species at specific sites. 
And then they fuse the cut strands from the different species back together. And also around the same time, they found a process to put DNA into the bacteria. And they observed that the bacteria would create little clones with this DNA. Uh, now, let me introduce you to Peter Carr, uh, who's the IGN director of judging. Um, Pete has been through the history of recombinant DNA within the IGEM competition, and he can talk about it. Uh, he's been going through things like the dark times of the Gibson Assembly Rebellion against the BioBricks, and he can talk about all these things now. Welcome, Peter. Um, this timeline uh, very closely parallels my own personal timeline from birth to the present, also around 50 years. Uh, I'm going to try and resist the urge to go uh, a lot into that timeline but particularly uh, I closely identify with two of the points on here, uh, one of which is the PCR polymerase chain reaction, uh, which you'll be hearing a little bit more about later, but uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it's a way of taking very tiny amounts of DNA, sometimes even one molecule of DNA, and making many copies of it until you have plenty of it to work with. And then there's all these other really useful things that PCR can be used for. Um, Part of my history is the good fortune and dumb luck to have been in the right place at the right time at two critical times. One was I had a chance to start learning about uh, molecular biology in the late 80s at the company where PCR was invented. Uh, and then uh, 20 years later, I had the opportunity where I was at MIT to connect with the people who founded the iGEM competition, Randy Retberg, Tom Knight, Drew Endy, uh, and others, and uh, and that really changed my whole career. That's when I started turning into a synthetic biology. And that there was a design exercise class in 2003 that was uh, connected to the, be the beginnings of iGEM in 2004. Uh, and part of that was, I came from the biology side of things as a scientist, learning uh, amongst other things about the ideas of standards in other disciplines and how they could be useful in, uh, in the process of engineering organisms. And I pushed back a little bit. I didn't understand everything at first, uh, but eventually it was really won over. And that was one of the many things about synthetic biology that really grabbed me. And I've been fortunate to be uh, involved in iGEM uh, in many different ways ever since. Uh, kind of coming up on 20 years now, which is hard to believe. Um, but uh, there's a lot of other meaningful things that could go on this timeline, but um, uh, two of them that are particularly standards based, I'm not sure if the arrows show up uh, uh, as well for everybody on their, their screens. But the, the standards that point to the BioBrick standard RFC10 uh, highlighted from around 2003, uh, and then uh, later on, type 2S restriction enzyme methods becoming a standard uh, within iGEM. And so we're not gonna have a long debate on the value of standards, but one of the things that they do, uh, a composition and assembly standards for DNA, uh, help people to understand the pieces of DNA that they're getting from somebody else and that, to make sure that how they work in their hands can be uh, as close as possible to how they work in whoever, whoever documented that DNA in the first place. Uh, and again, the compositional standards for how you put the pieces of DNA together can make a big difference in how you're able to share the results of your work. Early on, I was on a team that got a chance to contribute some of the earliest bio bricks in the registry. Uh, and there, a lot of them aren't profound other than they're very simple. But what we hadn't even identified the list of those parts. We took them from literature uh, or from, uh, in one case, Ron, Wein's, Ron Weiss's PhD thesis, uh, which partly came from literature too. And then we put them in the registry and they've been used over and over and over again simply by that act of bio-bricking. Uh, so don't underestimate the power of sharing. That's the main thing I wanted to, to hit uh, this particular point is those standards are there for a reason. We argue about them. There's value to them. Uh, and when you submit a part to the registry, uh, it, it's uh, expected and mandated that you submit them in one of those two formats, unless you've been given an exception. Uh, they, I encourage you to go to the registry pages uh, when it's uh, uh, useful for you, the registry of standard biological parts and learn more about the standards uh, information there. Thanks. Thank you, Peter. Yep the famous circle, the design, build, and test circle. So you probably have seen that circle before and you probably will see it again. So what is that? So we do engineer within a cycle called the design, build, test cycle. 
And in synthetic biology, um, the design and build phases include cloning and gene assembly. And then the testing part is the measurement and the analysis of the design that you built. So what do we do with that cycle? Well, uh, we do iterations or loops, right? We go in circle through each of this phase to improve the design and the build. And we iterate until we reach a goal, which can be um, just prove that our system is working or we want to produce a certain quantity of a molecule or we want to measure and signal an output or detect something or maybe just like iterate more and optimize. We want better, faster, stronger, and you know the song. Okay, now, now we're gonna go into the first phase, uh, which is the design phase. And design is the first abstract phase of the engineering process. And this is where you lay out your ideas and imagine how to implement them. And in the design phase, well, some good modeling can help you predict or at least give you a good idea about the des desired outcome of your system. So um, design is not only about the de de design of DNA itself, uh, but it's also designing at different levels. And you can see in the little box, um, when we design a genetic device, well, all the different levels are like, we can design uh, the experimental work, uh, we can design uh, the DNA plasmid, but we can also design the system and the processes. Uh, we can design the synthetic pathway and we also design the protein or the enzyme that we may want to produce. So design happens at all different levels. So um, the build slide. Well, the build phase is the second part of the engineering phase. And um, good building uh, starts with in the first place, good design and good planning. And now this build phase is the real and tangible world. Uh, this is where uh, we went from ideas, where this is where we actually build and do things and we put the molecules together and we move them around. Okay, so um, what's the cloning workflow? Um, so what is cloning? Cloning is the process of getting some DNA inside a host organism. And that DNA can be natural. Uh, it can be a gene from an organism, or it can be uh, synthetic DNA, or it can be a combination of both. But what you have to remember is that it is exactly the same DNA. It has the same molecules, it has the same physical properties, and it works exactly the same way. So here's an example of, of a cloning workflow. So we can go two paths and get the DNA from different sources. Um, so we can start with natural DNA or uh, synthetic DNA. And then what we do is that we assemble the pieces together and then we put them in the host organism. So um, along all the path, what we do is we cut the circular DNA open. We can do things like cutting pieces out or paste or the pieces in and stitch the pieces together uh, to get this DNA um, in the host organism. So the first step is, uh, for example, you want to isolate bacterial DNA. What you do is you actually extract the DNA from the living organism, and this is the bacteria are the natural sources of DNA if we want bacterial DNA. And then when you isolate the DNA in the form of a plasmid, for example, you um, going to use um, a method uh, in your lab that is called a mini prep. Uh, so you're going to be using a mini prep kit. And then we're going to go on to the next slide and talk about how do you get synthetic DNA. So nowadays, there are different techniques to synthesize DNA. There are companies that provide this service, and you can order little pieces uh, or multiple genes. And you start designing on your laptop uh, with some DNA design software. And this is called in silico design um, versus um, in vivo or in vitro design, or nowadays I would say in plastico. Uh, and then you place in your order and um, you get a letter back, you get that synthetic DNA gets shipped back to your lab. And this is exactly the same DNA that you find in nature and living organism but it's the one that you have uh, designed. So how do you um, cut fragments of DNA out? Well, uh, we can select and cut the different pieces of DNA 
with the help of restriction enzymes. And there are many types of uh, restriction enzymes and they cut in different ways and in different places. And um, these enzymes are also known as restriction endonucleases. And the places where these enzymes cut are called restriction sites. And these are like short sequences of four to eight base pairs. And these enzymes break apart the DNA. And this is why you just cut open some piece of DNA or you can select a fragment and cut it out. So you, you then, uh, with all your DNA fragments, you wanna recombine these into, um, into one piece of DNA. So some other enzymes allow us to join the molecules of DNA together. And uh, for example, a DNA ligase is a specific type of enzyme that facilitates the joining of DNA strands together. So these enzymes work with the complementarity of a DNA base pair and the DNA overhangs, which you can see here, it's the zoomed part. And ligation happens at a certain temperature. And we as engineers, uh, we control the temperature so we can um, decide when the ligation happens. So how do you insert that recombinant DNA into the bacteria? Well, there are multiple ways of getting the DNA into the cell. Um, the session is not uh, about this. Uh, we're not going to detail all those methods. Um, but basically, um, to get the DNA into the cell, well, it's a process that is called a transformation. And the cell is also called a host or a chassis. So when you do a transformation, it means you put in the DNA DNA, pardon, inside the bacteria. And now that uh, we've been through the whole workflow, I want to talk about um, something. Um, I want to talk about automation because uh, nowadays we can automate the lab workflow and do all the, um, we can automate all the liquid handling. And we have robots uh, that can do the cloning. That's awesome. Uh, you don't have to do it yourself. You just program them to do it for you. And uh, we can also program the measurements. And one of the advantages um, is that you can run multiple experiments in parallel, and you can also speed up the cycle um, that we've just seen. Uh, and there's some uh, industrial and research labs called uh, biofoundries, uh, DNA biofoundries. And this is where um, there, it's like a lab, but it's a place where they have uh, like automated DNA assembly chains. And this um, pushes back the scaling limits of what we've been able to build and test up to now. And that being said, I'm going to pass it on to Ian, who's going to talk about basic components of genetic circuits. All right. Thank you, Alexi. Um, so now I want to introduce you guys to some common components of a genetic circuit. Okay. So I now want to introduce you guys to some common components of a genetic circuit represented in the synthetic biology open language, which is how people communicate um, their genetic circuits and what parts they have on their genetic circuits universally. So every design for gene expression requires a promoter, ribosome binding site, and coding DNA sequence. The promoter sequence is a sequence of DNA that initiates transcription of DNA downstream of it. The ribosome binding site is a sequence that is responsible for the recruitment of a ribosome during the initiation of protein translation. Arguably the most important part of your genetic circuit, the gene of interest, or also commonly referred to as the coding DNA sequence, CDS, um, that contains a sequence that codes for your protein that the genetic device requires, or the basic part of your um, genetic device. Um, and then some Genetic circuits do require a terminator, while well, some don't, but a terminator is a sequence which marks the end of a gene during transcription, typically resulting in the final component of your genetic circuit. Together, these are common components that you will see in almost any genetic circuit and important to understand when constructing your own genetic circuit. So now moving on to design of designing your own genetic circuit. Uh, there are many considerations when designing a genetic circuit for your, pro uh, for your project that you should first ask yourself when you are entering the design phase. For example, what chassis should I use? Most commonly, uh, iGEM teams will use E. coli because it is a model um, organism that is very well understood and has robust engineering capabilities. But there is also limits to uh, E. coli that might cause you to consider other um, more complex um, organisms to engineer. 
or even possibly mammalian cells like yeast that have more um, complex metabolic capabilities as well. Also, we wanted to introduce um, what are your inputs and your outputs. Um, for example, what is causing your system to start or what is the induction of your genetic circuit? And um, what are you producing by putting that genetic circuit into an organism? And I'll go into that a little bit later in the next slide. Um, also want to talk about what genetic elements do you use? For example, when you are, gen uh, when you are uh, designing a, a genetic circuit with a certain goal or your output, um, you need to know what exactly uh, would require, what, what exactly, what, what, excuse me, what genetic elements require, are required for you to reach that goal, such as your promoters, what levels of expression, those kinds of questions you want to ask yourself. And then what is your experimental design? Um, how do you design a genetic circuit that can be structured in lab and experimentally tested? And that's a specific interest of the measurement committee when uh, we want to make sure that everyone's measuring um, efficiently and effectively. And then lastly, um, how do I optimize my system? So not only will you start to design your own genetic circuit and possibly build, but then you'll realize there is steps where you have to take um, action to reduce challenges in your system and optimize the outputs. So moving on, um, here I demonstrate an example workflow and the design of a genetic circuit. So for example, what I am proposing is I want to design a genetic device that will demethylate the chemical vanillate. So if we look at this uh, step one, my input is vanillate, as you see on the left side, and I highlight inside that red box the methyl, the methyl group, and I want to demethylate that and have an output of protocatechuate, which is just demethylated vanillate. And so that's what my first consideration is when I am uh, designing my genetic device. And so two, I move on. What genetic elements do I need for this system? For example, I need to, for my coding DNA sequence, I want an enzyme for the O demethylase mechanism that will turn my input of vanillate to the output of protocatechuate. And exactly what promoters, what, what expression levels, what ribosome binding sites that go with my coding DNA sequence, and if I need a terminator to stop the sequence from expressing. And then three, decide which chassis is best for this project. So I would choose Pseudomonas butida because vanillate is a toxic substrate that is known to possibly not be uh, specific or, or cause a metabolic burden upon E. coli or less um, or less capable engineered uh, organisms. So Pseudomonas butida is a soil bacteria that I use typically in my work, and it is a rising metabolically engineered um, um, organism coming up to date right now. And then uh, we are going to consider how we are going to build and test this design. For example, what PCR primer designs do you have to consider before you actually go into lab and start building them? And then your DNA assembly method, which one is working best for your organism and the parts that you want to put in place and the methods that you are available to you? Also antibiotic selection, which uh, antibiotics can your team use and which ones are best for your genetic circuit? And also, we want to talk about um, optimizing the circuit. And there's various ways to do this, but we're just going to list a few, such as varying expression. If you, have, uh, if you can't just push out as much protein as you want because it causes a metabolic burden, you have to possibly consider using um, a promoter library and testing different levels of expression um, so you don't kill all your cells in the process of making your genetic device. Also things such as um, maximizing output, how much enzyme are you putting into the system, for your output of protocatechuate, um, optimizing GC content. Some organisms have higher GC content, some sequences and proteins have higher GC content, which causes problems when you're engineering a uh, genetic circuit. And then reducing challenges is mostly the overview for optimizing your circuit. How can you reduce noise inside your um, your genetic circuit in your system and also other possibilities for reducing ways that is uh, um, causing your output to be less optimized. 
And so now I want to move on to uh, building of your genetic circuit and the considerations that arise when performing your cloning techniques and genetic assemblies, such as what methods are available for your team. I think every team should first consider this when they're building their genetic circuit. Um, how will you troubleshoot? Are you going, do you have a mentor or a PI that's going to be uh, there for you at all times? Do you have someone inside your, um, and also a lot of times the PIs have specific uh, um, specialties that don't, don't um, span all of synthetic biology. So how are you going to overcome challenges through building that your specific PI can't help you with? Also, um, how will you validate what you built? It's important for measurement that you are able to make sure that what you built is exactly what you, what you uh, say you are doing with a genetic device so that you can also earn medals inside of the iGEM competition. I know we all are looking towards those. And um, what tools and resources can you use? Which ones are at your disposal? And we will introduce you to those in a little bit. And also, uh, what reagents and protocols will you need? Another key important fact when you are building your genetic circuit and entering the cloning and assembly phase. And so we're going to refer back to that example workflow for building a genetic circuit. Again, I want to build a genetic device that will demethylate the chemical vanillate. And so here's an example workflow that I would choose for this sort of um, workflow. Anyways, um, so one, I would create the protocol and order required reagents. And this is where we go back to experimental design and how it affects your design before you go into the build phase. Also recording your, uh, ordering your required agents. There are several iGEM sponsors that we'll talk about later that offer, um, they have offers for iGEM teams to help you guys uh, simplify your cloning techniques. And um, then I would move on to two, purifying and synthesizing the plasmid. So referring back to what Alexi said, um, there, are two, there are two ways that you can do that. You can either purify your plasmid from an organism that you have inside the lab, or you can have a DNA company synthesize the plasmid for you. And so once you have this uh, purified uh, plasmid, you want to put inside PCR, polymerase chain reaction, to obtain the desired gene fragments. And as you see there, you have two overlapping genes that are ready to be assembled now after your PCR. And so then number four, I would move on to Gibson assembly. And so now I have these two gene fragments that are overlapping, as you can see there in the bottom left. And so as the green binds to the green and the blue binds to the, the template vac uh, vector and the red binds to the, or uh, excuse me, binds to the template vector, you get a total product that is assembled gene sequence or your plasmid now. And then five, you move on to transformation and antibiotic selection. And as uh, again, brushing up on what Alexi had touched on is um, you transform that final plasmid that you engineered and constructed, and then you use antibiotic, I want to introduce antibiotic selection. So in a lot of times inside your vectors, you will have a antibiotic gene that um, allows only the assembled plasmids, so only bacteria with the plasmids that you have engineered will grow on that plate. So it's a form of antibiotic selection that shows you that you have successfully transformed your, uh, your plasmid of interest. And then moving more away from the build phase and towards the um, test phase, I would go to verifying your plasmid with sequencing. And there are tons of companies that like Snapchain um, that work with other companies like IDT and to help you verify uh, your sequencing. And we won't get into that too much today, but it is one of the final steps when you are looking at a workflow for building a genetic circuit. And so I did want to um, go more in depth on polymerase chain reaction because it is a fundamental, uh, fundamental method that allows a single region of DNA to be copied multiple times. Um, first, I want to go into the diagram on the left. So in the, in, in the normal P PCR cycle, you have these basic components. You have your template DNA in the blue right here. You have your DNA primer that you create inside your software and you order on um, by DNA synthesis company. And then you have free nucleotides that help um, also ligate when the enzyme uh, or, or like, like a DNA polymerase comes, like a DNA polymerase comes and does the uh, elongation phase. 
So the first part is you have denat denaturation. You heat up the template plasmid and it denatures the um, two strands away from each other, allowing for your DNA primer that you designed to then bind to the sequence that it is chosen for. And then the enzyme comes along and it elongates that primer and then you have two separate DNA strands and you repeat this cycle up to 30, uh, up to 30 times and at the end of it you have a product with exponential number of copies of the desired gene fragment and it is ready for assembly. And a big thing that I did want to talk about too is primer design. Um, so how your primers are designed will determine the PCR product and the assembly. So we are not going to go too in depth into it right now, but I do want you guys to consider that when you are designing your primers, there is a lot to think about. And I hope you guys have somebody to help you with. And if not, we are the measurement committee and we are here to help you with uh, designing your primers. And so overview of assembly methods, we wanted to go over um, just a few common techniques that are used today, such as the bio brick assembly, and we're not going to go too, de too in depth on the uh, graphics. Um, they're more for you to look at and understand what I'm talking about. So, for example, the uh, restriction sites flank uh, every, gene, every gene fragment, allowing parts to be interchanged. But this also introduces scar sequences, while the other, um, the other assembly methods, like Gibson, uses an, an exonucleus, which creates large overhangs for annealing fragments allowing for more accurate assemblies. And as you see here, you see the overhangs between A and B, then bind together, and then the overhangs on the other sides of A and B bind to the template plasmid, and you have a final plasmid. And then in Golden Gate assembly, you have endonucleases, which creates fragment-specific overhangs, overhangs, allowing for 20-plus fragments to be assembled at once in a relatively short time. As you can see here in the diagram, you have several different um, interchangeable parts right here. And it is a more new technique that uses the type 2S um, cloning or uh, fragment device or restriction enzymes, excuse me. And I wanted to move on to uh, cloning and assembly troubleshooting. I think this is one of the most important parts when you are going into cloning and assembly methods. Um, so first I wanna talk about how do you validate your cloning and assembly steps with checkpoints? There's several ways. You can use gels in between. Um, and usually when you use gels, you have a restriction enzyme digest. So you have enzymes that come in and you will cut the plasma in half to verify on a gel that it is the correct size. And it's sort of a checkpoint that allows you to verify you have assembled the correct plasmid. Also, people will use colony PCR. So when you transform your um, plasmid into your, into your uh, bacteria or whatever chassis you are using, some people will use a PCR reaction to verify that the plasmid is of the size inside that, uh, inside that um, chassis that you've used. Uh, another checkpoint as well. And uh, going back to the antibiotic selection, so once you have transformed your, um, your plasmid, you want to make sure that it is the correct plasmid and only the bacteria that you are then going to use are only the bacteria that have that plasmid. And so you use an antibiotic plating technique where you will have uh, the, the antibiotic resistance gene built inside your plasmid, then you'll plate it onto a antibiotic uh, growth plate, maybe something with like LB and um, maybe carbonicillin, for example. And if your uh, plasmid has carbonicillin, and you see growth on that plate, then you know that you correctly assembled that plasmid. And then we move on again to sequencing to brush over, and that is sort of the final check on when you are doing cloning and assembly to make sure that not only did you assemble the plasmid correctly, but there aren't any mutations inside your gene of interest or the promoters that might cause any problems when you're moving on to the testing phase. And I also wanted to bring up, um, back, back uh, to Peter Carr, the iGEM director of judging to talk about um, just troubleshooting and how it's important. Yeah. Well, and again, on, on um, all of this process, you think when you're doing technical research, science and engineering, cru this crucial part of testing is gathering evidence. You're gathering evidence first that you built something uh, the way you intended to build it because it's not trivial. 
uh, and many of you will find it's not easy. It's worth it, but it's not easy. Uh, and uh, then once you've built it, finding out whether it works, that testing process, again, you're gathering experimental evidence to build a case that something either works or doesn't work. Before you worry about convincing the judges, you want to make sure you've convinced yourself and your uh, the fellow members of your iGEM team that it's working the way you want. And then you've got this, this dual issue of convincing and communicating. You, uh, when the, both the results that you have and how you present them to the outside world, including the judges, is crucial because people have to understand what you've done. Uh, and this comes down to all kinds of things, including choosing effective positive and negative controls for your graphs, choosing the right labels and information to share. Uh, if you're not sure whether your message is getting across, you might choose a colleague who's not in your iGEM team and see if they understand what you did uh, and agree with you that what you did worked or means what you think it means. So when it comes to uh, positive and negative controls, you know, a negative control kind of gets at the question, if we leave something out that should, um, that should uh, change the result, like if we leave out, let's say we're cutting a piece of DNA into two pieces, um, you may cut the DNA and then look at the results on a gel, like was mentioned. Uh, but if you don't include the material before it was cut, you don't have a good reference point. If you don't include standards uh, that let you know what the relative sizes of the pieces of DNA are, then you're kind of flying blind. If you show uh, a gel with one piece of DNA on it, one band, as you'll learn about, uh, without any reference points, uh, nobody's going to understand or believe uh, what, you, what you say about it. Uh, so uh, positive controls are often things that ought, just ought to work. Uh, sometimes when you're doing transformation, you'll use a dummy piece of DNA on some cells just to make sure the transformation process is working. So if you did that control with the pre-existing piece of DNA that often comes with the cells, if you buy them commercially, if you have a positive control like that and you don't get the results that ought to happen out of that, that tells you a lot about uh, what part of the process might have failed. So a lot of good troubleshooting in synthetic biology and others is thinking in advance what questions you might have to answer if something fails, and then you add those variables in ahead of time so that if something fails, you have those answers right away. You don't have to go back and do something. So there's a lot of good thinking and planning that goes into that, uh, both for uh, evidence that your cloning assembly worked and evidence that the things you made work the way that you uh, intended them. Thanks. Thank you, Peter. And then with that, um, we're going to move towards uh, cloning and assembly resources that are at your disposal as an iGEM member or iGEM team. And first again, we want to emphasize, use your mentors. They are your first step whenever you have any problems or whenever you have any questions. Whether that's your PI, your advisors, the grad students, whoever faculty are in the department, anybody that you know can help you out immediately. If not, then we do have the Agile Measurement Committee here to help. You can contact us for any cloning or friendly questions or concerns if you go to the Agile Measurement Hub, and we have our contact information there. And we'll be open at any time to answer your questions. We are constantly getting them, and we love helping you guys out. And um, not only do we have, um, not only can we answer your questions, possibly, um, but we also have resources on the iGEM Hub, such as uh, uh, statistical analysis software. We have um, um, sort of ways to do fluorescence and standardize your um, standardize your measurement there. And so we would sure we make sure that you check out the iGEM Measurement Hub when you are going to do cloning and assembly. Also, we are here to help with a summer webinar series that we're introducing later on in this iGEM year, where we can go further in depth in on some specific topics. Um, we have uh, office hours as well, where we hope that you guys come and bring specific questions and we can help you guys with whatever way we can. And we'll be hosting those and announcing those later on this year. And more specifically, I want to talk about uh, databases. So on any level of um, synthetic biology, you are going to use databases, whether you're an iGEM team or if you are a metabolic engineer, or professor, or researcher, or whatever it is. Um, usually, you have some sort of um, level of contact with databases, such as EcoPsych, which has all of the metabolic networks and gene networks and proteins um, known to uh, E. coli. 
I've used that several times, especially with my iGEM experiences. Um, Unipro and NCBI for DNA sequences and uh, metabolic networks of other organisms and chassis. Um, I still use that in my work today with the NREL. So I definitely recommend that you check out some databases when you are designing your experiments and going into the cloning phase. Um, moreover, I want to talk about the iGEM registry. And of course, it is one of the most profound um, collections of different parts. And that's all because of you guys. And we want to continue building upon that. But we also can only build upon that if you guys look at it and you guys try to design experiments and genetic circuits that develop further upon what other people have done. But moreover, we want to talk about the cloning and gene assemblies that are made easier by your iGEM sponsors. So there are many iGEM sponsors that have different offers for you, and we suggest that you go to the um, iGEM off, uh, sponsor offers website. It's on the iGEM um, main page. You can see it there. And um, moreover, you, uh, well, I want to talk about how Twist and IDT can do synthesis, or one of the, some of the DNA synthesis companies when you want to get a plasmid or whatever type of DNA sequences you're looking towards uh, building inside the lab um, that can shorten up your experience by actually just building the, the, by skipping cloning and gene assembly by just building the vectors for you um, there. And that way you can just transform it into your chassis. Um, uh, you know, reagent kits and several different tools and methods that, uh, and protocols as well while you guys are um, going through your cloning and gene assembly. So I definitely recommend checking those out. They have tons of uh, free tools that um, I still use today and so the lab all the time. And then going to uh, sort of cloning software and design software, um, Benchling, Snapging, and Genius are all very useful. I use both uh, Snapging and Benchling all the time to design my plasmids and my primers and then or use them to order uh, DNA sequences that I need from IDT or Twist, Genius for um, for sequencing. So definitely check those out, those offers. They're extremely helpful, and I don't know what I would do without them, honestly, and they make your life easier. And finishing off, uh, we want to say thank you, and we want to make sure that you guys have an exceptional year of iGEM inside this exceptional year because we are all dealing with um, the global pandemic. And we want to make sure that we're here for you because the iGEM Measurement Committee is actively working on preparing workshops this summer. So make sure to stay tuned to that. Um, we do want to make sure that you guys check out the Measurement Hub. There is tons of resources that I've mentioned inside this talk and um, ways that you guys can contact us through that page. And then um, we want to make sure that you guys tune into the next talk on this channel for software tools for genetic design um, from the Software Committee. And if you guys have any questions, we will Start to look at that. I'll stop sharing my screen. So I, I see a lot of questions uh, in the chat regarding which method to use. And the thing is, it's it's kind of hard to say which one because they're all specific. It depends on your project. Uh, there's no one method that is better than the other. And I think you should really discuss this with your mentors and your PIs because it, it depends on the context. Is It depends on what what you have in your lab, what equipment uh, can you access, um, what are the reagents you can get, um, and, and, and more specifically, what, what are you trying to achieve? Um, so Ian, maybe, like, would you have anything? Peter, yeah? Yeah, and I wanted to agree with that, that there's no substitute for good mentoring in iGEM. I had a question for you re as representatives of the measurement committee. The measurement committee is there to advise people on uh, a lot of things relating to measurement. Um, uh, does advising on DNA assembly methodologies, is that something that's included uh, that the measurement committee is willing to advise on, or is that better to seek out other other uh, folks for that? I don't want to sign you guys up for too much as part of it. Though. Yeah, and when you're considering which uh, assembly methods you want to choose, it's really um, dependent upon the first question that I want you guys to consider, which is, what is available to you inside your lab immediately in your iGEM team and what is your PI most comfortable with and your mentors most comfortable with? Um, besides that, then you can start looking into, um, I know NEB has a great uh, uh, flow diagram of exactly what 
types of uh, what, what the advantages are of each one. But again, it really depends on your specific project and your design. So if you have any questions, be sure to reach